I know I'm not supposed to love music, but I can't help it. I'm gonna be a musician! Miguel, get down from there! But my family thinks music is a curse. No music! I don't want to be in this family! Miguel! What are we going to do with that boy? I wish someone would help me follow my dream. On the day we remember our ancestors, what if they could help us to find our way? Who's in there? Mind? <laughs> Congratulations, guys. Thank you. Um, Coco is an absolute phenomenon. Um, I absolutely adored it myself. And um, I just wondered, what was it about Dia de Muertos that you wanted to tell in this latest uh, Pixar story? Um, well, I had long been interested in Dia de Muertos. Mm -hmm. I lived in Los Angeles for a long time when I was going to college, and uh, it's, of course, a very big Latino community there. Mm -hmm. And um, I first became kind of enchanted by the, the, the folk art and the iconography of the celebration. And um, that had always been kind of sitting in the back of my head. And then after we finished making Toy Story 3, started kicking around different ideas, and um, it occurred to me that I couldn't remember any live action or animated film that used Dia de Muertos as its backdrop. Mm. And so um, we started doing a bunch of research in earnest and talking to a lot of folks. And uh, what I learned that I didn't know is that Dia de Muertos is kind of less about death and more about family mm. and this obligation that we all have to remember our loved ones and to make sure that their memories stay alive through passing along their stories. And that just seemed like such a beautiful idea to me. And I saw the potential for telling a mm you know, a, hopefully a big adventurous movie that also had a lot of heart and a lot of emotion in it. And uh, Darla, when did you know that you guys had found your Miguel in Anthony uh, Gonzalez? Because he is, he's incredibly charming, uh, especially for such a young actor. You said um, last night at the premiere, he was 11 when the film started, he's 13 mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's just, he's fantastic. Yeah, well, we did a huge search. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, we listened to hundreds and hundreds of kids. We went all over the United States and in Mexico. And, and Anthony was uh, this amazing young man who was in Los Angeles, and we were bringing him up uh, to do some of the temporary voice for us. So we were working with him. And um, we uh, slowly grew to, uh, well, not slowly, it was over the course of a couple of months. And he, he gradually became, it became obvious he was the best possible person for Miguel. And he's so charismatic. Yeah. He's so talented. He's so charming. And he's got this um, great combination of uh, pure innocence but definite maturity. Mm. Uh, and I think a lot of that radiates off the screen. And if you think he's charming in the movie, you should meet him in real life. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I mean, he's incredibly, he just lights up the room. And how, because you obviously got to see him kind of uh, grow through this film. What's his experience been like? What's it been like watching him, seeing all of this happen? Like, because he's he'll I'd say he'll explode. He'll uh, his career will explode. Well, he uh, yes. probably... he don't he doesn't need us. He's like <laughs> he's really good, and you're going to be seeing more of him. Yeah. And you'll actually be seeing him because he's <laughs> doing some live action <laughs> stuff now. But. Um, it's been really fun. I mean, he, as Darla said, he's just had this sweet innocence mm -hmm. through the whole process. He loves to work. You know, we would have these four or five hour recording sessions and when we would, when we'd be done for the day and I'd tell him, that's it, we're done, he would invariably be disappointed because he just wanted to keep going and going. Mm -hmm. He loves what he does so much and he's loved being a part of this movie. And The Land of the Dead is such a, an integral part of the story and such a beautiful backdrop. What was the most important aspect of it that you, um, as both director, producer, and the animation team wanted to get across for the characters and the city as a whole um, on the screen? Um, I wanted to depict a land of the dead that was wholly different than mm -hmm. anything that had been put on screen before, but I also wanted it to feel quintessentially Mexican. Mm -hmm. So um, there are a lot of influences that uh, kind of led to the, our depiction of the land of the dead. Um, uh, I wanted there to be a logic to the world. I imagined a world that was constantly under construction because more and more people were dying every yeah. day. Um, so we have these huge kind of towers encrusted with buildings that kind of fill the landscape of the land of the dead. And they represent layers of history, uh, Mexican history specifically. So down at the base of every tower, there's an Aztec pyramid. And as you go up, there are kind of layers and layers of more and more modern architecture. Um, 
the look in general was greatly inspired by a city that we visited in Mexico called Guanajuato, mm. uh, which is this lovely city that's kind of in a valley and um, all of the buildings are very, very colorful. All the buildings are encrusted into the hillside and it's really striking to visit there. And <clears throat> um, so we wanted to have a bit of that kind of feeling in our land of the dead as well. And there's a lot, there's a lot of great uh, construction gone into the Alabrijas. Is there a particular favorite of yours that, you know, maybe we catch a glimpse of or that? Because my particular favorite would be Papita. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's maybe going to be a lot of people's favorites. <laughs> I think she will be. Yeah. But is there a particular favorite that you, that you saw designed or maybe just flew across the screen that you just kind of fell in love with? Uh, well, I love so many of them, but I, I like Frida Kahlo's monkey. Because I, oh, yeah, I love nice. monkeys. So. And breathing fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fire, yes. And so on. Yeah, and Pepita, hands down. Yeah, because yeah. who doesn't want a giant flying jaguar yeah. that's <laughs> neon colored? Yeah. I mean, and, I bio and bioluminescent. Exactly. So. I mean, it's just, it's just, it just, she jumps off the screen, really. Yeah. Um, and with the people as well, there was such a, an interesting movement, like, because obviously the characters are dead, they don't need to worry about damage or that. Was that important for you, like, how Hector moves? He moves, like, he understands that, yeah, the laws of physics don't really matter to me anymore. How important was that to animate, uh, to make sure that it was uh, looked authentic? Well... We knew that the skeletons were going to be the source of a lot of entertainment, just purely through yeah. their, the style of their animation. Um, we had a logic in the Land of the Dead that the, the more well-remembered one is, the more healthy you are. Oh, okay. And for a skeleton, health is reflected through kind of how clean and white and bright your bones oh, are, yeah. but also the kind of the, the, the magic uh, forces that are holding the skeletons together. For someone like Ernesto de la Cruz, who's really, yeah. really well-remembered, um, he's very taut and you know, he doesn't fall apart at all. But for someone like Hector, who's closer to being forgotten, he's kind of decaying, he's mm. brown and yellow, and, uh, and he's constantly falling apart yeah. because the, kind of the magic rubber bands have lost their strength. Mm. And it was fun kind of having that as a, a kind of a logic in the land of the dead to kind of drive how everyone was animated. Mm. Now, there's no uh, formula to uh, Pixar film. Uh, but is there a kind of thing that you put it through a testing uh, to know that it's it's hitting what you wanted to hit when you know you want to get to audiences? Like, is there something that you want to make sure it has the heart, it has the humor, um, and has because there is action in this and it's quite uh, uh, bombastic when it happens. So, is there any kind of testing uh, style that you need to a film like this needs to go through mm -hmm. for hits audiences? I mean, so uh, as we're making the movie, about every four months we put mm -hmm. the film up uh, for Pixar internal audiences. Oh, okay. And mostly, uh, we're just trying to get everything right. Mm. Uh, and each film, as you said, is a different fingerprint, yeah. a different kind of, it's got its own uh, unique voice to it and cadence to it. So, um, but towards, I don't know, probably about, I guess, 70% into it, we do bring it out to a outside audience. And as filmmakers, we're mostly just trying to figure out where we have the audience and where they're not as engaged, and but there's not necessarily any percentages we're looking for. We mm. just we just really want to be telling great stories that people are connecting with um, on all those levels you mentioned: the humor and the heart and the emotion um, uh, with what Lee's vision is and the team's vision is. Mm. And finally, um, I'll just say now: doors are locked. There is no escape. Can you let us know <laughs> about Toy Story Four in like just like a little bit? I will tell you one thing, which Please. is that it exists. I, it's being well made. played. <laughs> well played. I can tell you something. Tom Hanks oh, is going to be in it. I was mine. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I knew you were going to do that. But guys, listen. William Buzzer in it. <laughs> <laughs> guys, thank you so much. Thank it has you. been an absolute pleasure. And congratulations on Coco. Thank you. Thank you. Disney Pixar's Coco in cinemas January 2018.